So there are a few uh, things that are, I think, worth going over. Um, there, so I think the thing that I'm imagining that um, it, for people who may be having difficulty with this question, where I can imagine people having difficulty with is um, translating from the information that's given in the question to to actually getting to the final answer here. There are a few steps you have to go through and um, the question doesn't give you any guidance. And uh, that's uh, kind of closer to how real world problems are like. So I, I think it's uh, good for you to kind of struggle with that. And if you figured it out, great. And for those of you who, who still might be struggling with it, let me uh, walk you through the, the reasoning processes that you should go through. The first thing is you should understand the, the particle in a box setup. And so that's the starting place. So let me quickly recap what particle in the box um, analysis in the textbook section um, what you should have taken away from the, the coverage in the textbook. So I'm just going to draw sketch up few uh, first few levels, um, the wave function of first few levels. This is the, the ground state wave function, kind of standing wave looking thing. And um, this is the first excited state. And, and uh, let me draw up to the third excited state. The reason I like to draw these uh, standing wave solutions to the particle in a box is it's kind of the only setup where you can get solutions this way. It's uh, that's why it's the simplest possible example of um, fully well quantum mechanical wave mechanical treatment. So um, the way I like to remind myself what the allowed energies are. So the uh, the allowed energies uh, e one e two. E3, uh, the easiest way to remember them is by remembering the quantization condition on the wavelength. So, um, so when you look at the wavelength um, parameterized by quantum number n, um, you can kind of see it here. Oh, I guess I should label the length of the well or length of the box. Then, um, so I can see that lambda one is 2L Lambda two should be just to L. So working through, okay, it should be two uh, L divided by N. That's going to give you the allowed wavelength. And once you, and by the way, all this is something that you can actually also look up from the section because we do cover um, particle in a box in detail. But particle in a box again, because it's the simplest possible setup, you can actually get the answers without all the complicated math. And I'm going through how I remember this. So once you have the a lot of the wavelengths, then you have a lot of the momenta. Uh, through the de Broglie relationship, Planck's constant divided by the allowed wavelengths. And once you have as far as the allowed momenta, and you remember that uh, with the particle in a box, this is where you said potential energy equal to zero. So the, for the particle that's confined within the box, it only has kinetic energy. Um, no, no potential energy. So when you try to express the total energy of the particle in the box, then all you have to worry about is kinetic energy, which can be expressed as momentum squared over 2m. So I plug in all these expressions to get my final expression for energy, which again, you can just look up if you want it to. <laughs> this, this is me just uh, recalling how the argument comes together. So I should have h squared and over lambda squared. Um, so I remember, imagine taking reciprocal of this. So this n will go in the numerator. So there should be n squared here. And on the denominator, I have 2l squared. So 4l squared, 4 times 2 is 8. So I have 8ml squared. So this is the expression for the allowed energy levels. Now, once you have that, either by redriving it or just looking up, looking it up from textbook section, um, what you have to kind of, you have to do a little bit of um, 
problem text reading and uh, translate from its English description that uh, it says to excite an electron, uh, blah, blah, <laughs> requires this much energy. So the information that it's giving here, it's actually telling you change of energy because what the question is describing is a change of state from a state, from the first excited state to the third excited state. Um, so even though it says first, the phrase excited makes me think that this should ought to be n equals two state. That's what first excited state is. N equals one is the ground state. So to its third excited state, okay, this is where it's getting confusing, but if I'm counting, okay, this is the first excited state, so this is second. So the third excited state should mean n equals four. So what the question is, the information that the question statement is giving is uh, saying that the energy difference from n equals four to n equals two state, um, or you know, the question has it stated the other way uh, where you're trying to go from n equals two to four, so it requires energy. But if you're going from four to two, then it would be giving up that energy. Either way, change of energy from energy, uh, the difference between energy of state n equals four and the state n equals two is 16 EV. That's what the question is giving you. So let me uh, plug in the rest of the expression here so that I solve it partially. And then um, since it's asking me for the, the size of the box, I will solve the resulting algebraic expression for, for L. So uh, the first term here, plugging in n equals four, I have four squared or 16 h squared over eight ml squared minus plugging in two, so two squared or four, h squared over eight ml squared. Okay, um, it looks like everything is the same except for this 16 and four. So I can imagine factoring everything else out and take the difference of 16 minus four, that'll get me 12 times h squared over eight ml squared. Okay, uh, let me solve this. So this is equal to this delta E or for my version of the question, 16 EV. Let me uh, solve this for L and, um, and see what we get. So solving it for L. Um, so I'm gonna put L by L on its own. So L squared is equal to um, 12 H squared over 8m times 16 EV. Oh, is this one of those questions where, oh, I think I can actually demonstrate um, use of electron volt units here. So, so I'm going to look up one number um, and I'm going to look up that one number in the correct unit. And once I do that, I, uh, at the level, I have uh, some constants memorized. I won't have to look up any other number. Oh, let me put this in here. I didn't quite want to erase it. Um, so the one number I have to look up is the Planck's constant. I think I have it roughly memorized, but not well enough to actually um, you know, do it without looking it up. So let me, um, let me look up that one number that I don't quite have fully memorized. So I think your textbook lists uh, Planck's number at, in the appendix, um, fundamental constant. And one interesting thing that you will see your textbook do is it'll list the Planck's number in two different units. Uh, Planck's constant, it lists it in, or it should have, does it not? All right. Um, okay, that is annoying. Um, <laughs> let me look up a different textbook where I have. Okay, so. All right. Um, I, I say this is annoying because uh, um, really, this is the place where it's uh, starting. 
where you should find, um, start to see the utility of using Planck's constant in electron volt units. And this basic SI unit description, it, it makes you do uh, extra work that you should be, be able to avoid doing. So let me see if I thought in your tech, within your, um, within your textbook, actually there was a, well, okay, I, I don't think I have to look it up this way. I think uh, I remember the section where we introduced the plants constant. Um, I guess one thing I'm not sure is if uh, your textbook ever listed in the electron volt unit. I hope it does, um, but if it doesn't here, then I'm just gonna go uh, Google search it because uh, <laughs> uh, it's uh, quite annoying that it doesn't list it in electron volt unit. Yeah, it doesn't. All right, I'll just, uh, um, well, I'll look it up from a textbook that I control. Uh, I, I can also Google search it, but uh, th this is at least uh, Planck's constant in electron volt units is 4.136 times 10 to the minus 15 EV second. Now, the, so if you are going to the trouble of using Planck's constant in electron volt units, there are some things that you have to do to make sure to do correctly so that you don't create extra work for yourself. The big one is the electron mass. Uh, if you look this up in basic SI units and plug in that uh, basic SI unit value of electron mass, then um, then you end up creating more work for yourself. So what you have to be sure to do is you have to sure, be sure to plug in the electron mass in the um, in the convention that's more common in particle physics, which is to say that electron mass is given through its rest energy. It's uh, 0 0.511 times 10 to the six uh, electron volt. So that's the rest energy. It's used to common enough that I have it memorized divided by C squared. It's because we do want mass. We don't want the rest energy. So let me do a little bit of a housekeeping here. And I think I can do the remainder of the calculation on a uh, calculator. So uh, let me finish up this algebra. I don't want L squared, I want L itself. So I'm gonna take the square root of both sides. And when I do that, what I end up with is, um, so I think I can pull out some things. H squared, I can pull out H. And this M is gonna turn into this number divided by C squared. So I get C squared on the numerator. So I have H times a C that comes out, square root it, um, 12 divided by eight times 0 0.511 times 10 to the six electron volts um, times 16 electron volts. And I'm gonna do a quick uh, unit check so what I want to make sure is that my units will all work out. So when you look at the unit of H from the, for the number I'm gonna plug in, it has a unit of electron volt. So I the, the unit of electron volt in the numerator is going to get canceled out by electron volt squared, square rooted. So uh, the energy unit is taken care of. I have second in Planck's constant. Speed of light is given in meters per second. So seconds will cancel out. So when everything is said and done, I'll be left with the unit of meters, uh, which I can convert to nanometers easily enough. Okay, so I think I can do the rest of the calculation in a calculator without you know, using Wolfram Alpha, which <laughs> uh, does help out with the working at the units. Okay, um, what can I erase? Let me just erase all these things. I don't think I needed this. Uh, oh. I took the trouble of moving, but I guess I end up erasing it anyway. Uh, or maybe just to this. I guess uh, depending on how you came to this question, you might just have this energy formula to work with anyway. Okay, so 
Let me do the thing inside the square root first. So that's 12 divided by eight, still divided by 0 0.511 times 10 to the power of six, still being divided by 16. All of that, uh, let me take the square root. Okay, that's the thing, um, the square root is the quantity all handled together. Multiply that with the Planck's constant in the units that I looked up, 4.136 um, times, uh, or times 10 to the power of uh, minus 15 times uh, C, which is uh, speed of light. So three times the 10 to the eight. Um, so three times 10 to the power of eight. Okay, so that's the answer I got. Um, so to convert this number to nanometers, uh, I need to multiply this uh, 10 to the nine. Uh, there are 10 to the nine nanometers in one meter. So, um, so multiply this by one times 10 to the power of nine. So 0 0.531 nanometers is the width of the uh, box that would result in the, uh, the energy difference between these two levels becoming um, the energy that's given. <laughs> Sorry, it's quite a bit of winding path you have to work through. And so 0 0.531. And I don't think this is a question I programmed in, so I hope it's all graded as correct. And okay, correct. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, this phrasing kind of um, gives me a little bit of a hesitation because <laughs> I think this is a place where people can easily make a mistake. You know, you see the word first and you immediately say think n equals one. It's the excited state. And we start out with the ground state. So, and. Uh, and uh, the convention about the quantum number, and it's something to be careful about, is I think you're going to see this week, when we deal with the uh, harmonic oscillator, n is actually going to start with a zero. So the ground state actually has n equals zero. The first excited state has n equals one. So how this, uh, um, in what order this quantum quantization number goes in, kind of depends on context. So. Uh, so you should be familiar with it. And this is where, you know, drawing that picture of the standing wave, it does help to remind, remind, it does help remind you that n equals one state is the ground state. 